The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the third lecture of the third movement of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. I've mentioned before that this piece is sometimes thought of as being in sonata form, though I don't really subscribe to that. I'm with the opinion that this really is just a set of theme and variations. So in this lecture, Let's explore the third and the fourth variations, and then we can make our fourth and final lecture all about the last variation and the outro. The music just wrapped up a beautiful pastoral cadential phrase ending on this F. If you were thinking of this as sonata form, you might think of this as the recapitulation, but there are so many recapitulations, it really is theme and variations. Coming back to the key of F, but soon he is going to return to the theme in another key for another variation, so let's not get hung up on sonata form. Here we have this beautiful plucking, so reminiscent of what's come before. The obligato first violins, and then the development of that obligato by the lower strings. And now, a very, very simple, very plainly stated continuation of that idea in the second violins and violas, playing in octaves. And once again, I could <laughs> have a lot to say about this, I suppose, if I were taking it apart in terms of harmonic analysis. But in terms of orchestration, it just is what it is, as people say sometimes. Pretty much staying within the register of the staff for both instruments sometimes reaching a little bit above, sometimes a little bit below, but always right in that very simple middle area that isn't going to stand out too much. One thing that I really love about this is that right at the beginning of the restatement of the melody, there's this lovely little A down here, the median note of an F major chord, suggesting a 6-3 chord on the downbeat. And that's so elegant. <laughs> it's just that one little grounding thing, which also helps everybody keep track of where they are in the music. If the clarinetist hears that pluck and they haven't come in, then they will know that they are a little late and they'll have to make up for it very quickly. And it helps everybody else who's got tacits with their counting. So here we've got a sort of variation of the melody, wonderfully reimagined, and set right in the lower clarino and throat tone register of the clarinet. And it has such beautiful expressiveness and simplicity. It's really just a joy to hear. And then right here at the end, first flute comes in and supplies a little bit of commentary. And then here, Berlioz says, echo. <laughs> he wants the same exact ending of the phrase to be played again really softly in the way that clarinets can do like no other wind instrument in the orchestra. And of course this lovely little dip down from a C to an F in the first violins becoming part of what's going on in the flutes. Right here this reach up from the flutes gives context to the continuation of the melody almost seeming to supply a G leading to this sounding E right in here, written F sharp. As this continues on, sort of reaching higher every single time, 
all the way up to B. And it really makes the B sound very clear and like an ultimate note. This is the high note that we can reach. Of course, just ignoring the fact that it goes all the way up to C sharp and D. But a really good player will make that feel like the apex of everything that's going on in such an effortless way. I really love the way that these notes are emphasized right at the beginning of each beam group. Now, here's a direct quote from Beethoven from the Sixth Symphonies on Dante. Of course, in Beethoven's symphony, it just went... And here Berlioz develops it a little bit by diving down an octave and ascending. The plucking just continues on. It's a little kind of obligato accompaniment. And we're adding some more pizzicato here in the bass, some ones and fives relevant to the ascension of the harmony. But what's really, really cool is the Divisi cellos holding on to this C and then slowly walking up all the way up to this F. Now the way that these notes are slurred note to note to note, that is probably something that was in Berlioz's score and may originally just have been a slur from here to there and then a slur from there to there. And then he added this slur in the middle because he just felt that the whole thing should be under one bow. So depending on how fast the piece is going and how softly the cellos are playing, they may elect to divide it right here anyway and to go to an up bow here and then change to a down bow right there in order to give this a little bit more pressure. But it is very cool how these two parts, the first violin and the cellos, end up harmonizing right here on this F third, right as the clarinet reaches a sounding high A. Beautiful harmonic support, very subtle and wonderfully orchestrated, especially adding this F an octave below the other Divisi cellos. Now this is really great, the contrary motion here, walking up to D, and then here, pizzicato, changing over in the first violins and returning to the cellos, walking downwards to hit this G right in here. And this is basically setting up the next variation, which is going to be in C. So it's just one of those typical cadences with a 6-4 one chord, going to a 5-7 chord, and then ending on a one chord in C. But still really beautifully set up, and I really love these trills right in here, adding some pressure without getting too intense. At the same time, we've got these C thirds right here changing to B, D, and F with the G underneath, making that a G7 chord. And then that beautiful clear note from the clarinet up here, this high sounding C written D. Bum, 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 leading forwards. And just mentioning really quickly that these notes written E right in here are going to be G, just helping to underline the C6-4 chord going to a G7th. And of course, these are also Gs on the same pitch in the first horn. So we'll check out <laughs> the next variation. But let's listen to this first. All of those wonderful things, the way that this wraps up, you hear those high winds coming in here to support the clarinets from below. And then the growing strength with these repeated Gs in the horns and the trills in the cellos right here, pushing forwards as the little obligato pizzicato comes down. Obligato pizzicato. That would be a really cool name for something. And this little Beethoven quote right here. Dun, 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 dun. Very much a quote from the Pastoral Symphony. And these rising cello notes. The normal notation for this would just be to have one big slur reaching from C to F. But I like the fact that this gives us the option of just getting rid of the slur if we need to and adding an up bow there and then a down bow there. I think that probably would be how you would play it if this was being taken a little bit slower. And then of course the fives and the ones right in here and the ever upward reaching clarinet going all the way up to this written B flat feeling so much like the top of the phrase. And then Berlioz goes even a little higher and a little higher. Really, really lovely scoring on this page. And then reaching back 
to the whole setup here, the lovely beginning of the little pizzicato obbligato, and this devastatingly elegant A being played down here in the cellos and the double basses, marking the beginning of the clarinet solo right in here, so wonderfully placed in the lower clarino and throat tone register of the clarinet, and this lovely echo right in here that's sandwiched between the reactions from the flute and a touch of first violin. Listen to all that, and then we'll be back for the next variation, changing to C. And now we arrive at a beautiful moment of serenity. The second violins are going to take over the melody here. And this is one of those places where the seconds show that they can really shine. <laughs> now, of course, the first violins are being given this obbligato right in here. And as the more experienced players, it really is best left to them. It depends on how the strings are seated, whether or not you will have one of two different effects. With the normal seating, as of today, where the seconds are placed behind the firsts, in other words, to the left of the conductor and just in the next wedge over from the first violins who will be right on the edge of the stage. If you have that configuration, then you will hear a slightly more distant sound, but still very present. Now, if you have the seconds to the right of the conductor, pretty much the way that they would have been placed normally around 190 years ago, then you have a different effect of the second violins with their tone holes slightly oriented away from the audience. So there's a bit of reflection from the back wall of the concert hall bouncing that sound back at the audience. So even a little bit more distant. So whether or not Berlioz intended that, or he just gave this to the second violins because he wanted the firsts to be able to deal with this, is anybody's guess. But I would like to think that Berlioz thought of that as well, and took every element he could think of into account as he scored this. Beautifully placed to speak lyrically at the beginning of the violin's upper register. Meanwhile, we've got this obligato thing going on right in here, just dancing around in the background behind the second violin's melody. Going back to the way Berlioz was feeling when he first stated the Ide fix, he's got this da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da happening from the lower strings, and that so much brings to mind the kind of trembling heartbeat that he expressed under the Ide fix, doesn't it? only in this case, constantly pulsing. He has really got it bad, folks. <laughs> and here we're seeing that. As this melody wends its way through the music, we see a counter melody arising from all the first players of the wind section, the fourth horn, and then of course adding the second bassoonist. Piano dolce against this piano crescendo right in here. It will be enough to not outplay the seconds, but the conductor may have to balance right in here if they're working with a less experienced orchestra. Of course, if you've got a C horn and you're playing something in C major, it's very, very easy to reach all of those needed notes. G, E, C, G, F, F, E, G, G, E. 
It's all right there in the overtones of the C horn, and it will sound at the same pitch as the bassoons right in here. So that's a wonderful combination of two bassoons and horn playing together softly. And then we've got stacked octaves, the clarinets play an octave higher than that, and the first oboe and first flute playing unison an octave higher than that, and so on. There's no need to double the clarinets to get a kind of unity of strength across the octave, just in case you were wondering. Now, pretty much the same thing is continuing on. At this point, though, we have a little bit of unity between the parts. Da -da -dum, da -da -dum, which is harmonized by the second violins, up a sixth. Ba -ba -ba. I can't sing that high. Not anymore, anyhow. But essentially, things are going on the same way, even if these parts are starting to conspire, rather than to essentially contrast each other, the winds and horns versus the seconds. Now, this is very, very cool right in here. Quasi niente, practically nothing, <laughs> is the way that that should be interpreted. So everybody just drops down to as soft as they can play and still be heard. Notice that the horn drops out. So it's just the winds playing in extremely manageable registers. So they can all play very, very soft. Of course, nobody can play as soft as the clarinet right in here and the strings. However, it really shouldn't be a situation where the second violins play quasi niente, and in fact, they aren't marked as such. It's just marked quadruple P. These intensely exaggerated dynamics are also something that Berlioz normalizes in symphonic scoring with this piece. But certainly, really controlling things down to almost nothing with the winds pays off beautifully. So essentially, except for like the last couple of beats here in the strings, these are mirror images. The first part making the first statement, and then the second part just echoing it. Similar to how he had the clarinet echo itself at the beginning of the previous variation. Now here, we see the little obligato part being taken up by both violins, except they're not playing octaves here, they're harmonizing at the sixth, and climbing ever higher, and then continuing on in harmony right in here, and as the music goes forward, they start to go into contrary motion right in here, and we are really turning on the Beethoven on this screen and the next one, and we'll explore that in more detail in a minute, but just make sure that you are cognizant of that little contrary motion right in here. And these chords right in here are very reminiscent of Beethoven. I will take one of them apart for you, not the first or the second, but the third one right in here, because it's got the most going on. Even though these are both scored as G's, slurring down to an E, what you've really got here is G an octave lower and B flat down a sixth here in the E flat horn. Here in the F horns, this is playing a C fifth, right? So if you were to add all the harmony together, you would have a C fifth with the sounding G on top being doubled by the C horn, and then a B flat added on top so that you've got yourself a nice little C seventh chord. Now the bassoons are catching the median of that chord, so there really isn't any need for the horns to put an E in the middle of this C fifth. We've already got it right there, and we've also got an E below that, and you can see some of the same pitches in the strings as well, like the same E that the first bassoon is playing is being played right here. And then we've got a B flat down here, and then C octaves, and so on. It's all spelling out a great big C7 chord. Continuing on to the upper winds, we've got the mediant up here, the E being doubled by the first oboe. And then below that, we've got ourselves our B flat, our little seventh giving us more harmonic context. Then of course, right in here, we've got the same thing, B flat on top, and then this would be an E. So E is really strongly supported going through this chord, and that just goes back to something that I've observed in 2T chords in classical scoring and early Romantic, and that is 
that the fifth of a chord doesn't really need all that much support. If you look at what the winds are doing, there are no G's at all in the winds. And if you look at the horns, there is some doubling up of the G right in here, this sounding G and this G an octave lower. But if you look at the rest of the strings and so on, I mean, you've got this one G right in here, but there is no real need to kind of hang on the G, except for just running into it as part of this obligato right in here. So it's really the root and the third, giving the harmonic context of whether or not it's a major or minor chord, and of course the seventh, because this is a big C seventh chord and Berlioz wants you to hear that tension. We're going to look at one more screen in this lecture, but let's listen to everything else in this variation up to the ending that he puts onto it, which we'll analyze in just a few minutes. And then I'll stop and save the rest of it for the final lecture. So listen to all of this, the very Beethoven-like chords here in the winds and brass, the continuation of that pulse, da-da-da, da-da-da. Da, 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 just getting more and more intense and pushing towards the resolution coming on the next screen. And then, of course, following how things are starting to work in contrary motion, where they started off harmonized here at the beginning of the screen, and also noting how much divisi is being used in here. This could be played double stop or divisi. This right in here would be really easy to play double stop. Then all of the other things here, the echo, quasi niente, of what happened at the beginning, the way that the second violin part and the winds are starting to conspire rather than work contrary to one another. And then, of course, the first page, where the second violins really come into their own. And the winds provide a counterbalance. It's all such fantastically great scoring. Listen to that with the upcoming screen twice if you have to, to get all the details. And then we'll take a look at the very last screen of this lecture. that leads up to this beautiful, bustling F major chord. And this is right out of Beethoven as well. Very, very reminiscent of some of the chords that are in the Pastoral Symphony, I would think most inspired by the final movement. So let's pick this one tutti chord apart, and then we'll analyze the rest of the page, and you can have a listen to it. Starting with the strings, once again, cellos and double basses being placed up. And in this case, they're two octaves apart, right? Because this is sounding down an octave. So on the cello staff, that would be right down here at the bottom of the staff. And then right in between this double octave, Berlioz has placed these bassoons right in here, playing an F third in the middle. So you've got the F octave, F F, F, and not only this A, but doubling on the same F with the cellos, we've got this part of this double chord, this double stop, along with the C. So it's filling in an F octave chord right in here. F, A, C, F. At this point, we are getting into the territory of the horns with the C right here in the violas being doubled by this C in the fourth horn. And then the F at the top here with the cellos and violas being doubled by the E flat horn. And then above that, 
we've got this F third. So it's beautifully filled in right in there, just very rich and solid. After which, Berlioz tells the third horn, hey, change to F. So we're going to have three F horns plus a C horn going forward. So what's happening above that? Well, we've got these F thirds in octaves, F and A here, and then the same thing above, which is going to tie over to here as the strings walk downwards. Now that's a trick that Beethoven did not do. He liked to keep his harmony very, very clear, rather than having something like this suspending as the harmonic motion in other parts changed. He did have some intriguing harmonic tricks, though. I'm not writing off Beethoven, but this is just something new that Berlioz put in there, to have this F-third hold on as the other parts walk down harmonically. So F-thirds and octaves... And right here we've got A octaves in the clarinets. So that will be doubling the top note of this violin on top here with the first clarinet, while the second clarinet is doubling the same note <clears throat> is doubling the same note as first horn. Here we've got oboes in fifths with the first oboe supplying the missing fifth between these two F-thirds, so the C sitting right in here is being played right there, and then we've got F-octaves. Notice how the editor puts in this dashed tie to a little F eighth note right in there to keep this doubling consistent across all these beats up to here. So as you can see, the tonic here on this high F is being played by flute, and Berlioz isn't even bothering to have anything double the A on top, because that will ring through fine all by itself. Of course, this is classical to late romantic scoring. That isn't something you might get away with with a big modern orchestra. You might want to put piccolo on top there to double that one high note if you had it, or reconfigure this kind of harmonic approach. So what is the thing that we notice here? Just like the last time I broke down a tutti, the fifth of the chord is really haphazardly being realized. Where does it play C? Just right up here. One single note in the oboe is quite enough. And it might even have been left out were it not for the fact that that place in the harmonic voicing going forward is required. So Berlioz puts it in right here. Where are some other C's? Well, there's this C right down here being played by the violas, and that's being doubled by the fourth horn. And that's pretty much enough, isn't it? C's are not really required all over the place to give this chord its harmonic context of being a big F major chord. And then, of course, we've got this big thump on your timpani with a spongy beater by a soft beater right in here. And that is just doubling the F in between these two Fs right in here. The same note that's being played by second bassoon. So yeah, that's a very, very cool Beethoven-like voicing right here. And Berlioz was to move forward with his scoring. If you study his works, even just a work that was written quite soon after Symphonie Fantastique, like Lelio. You see that he moves forward with his own vision of how to voice big tutti chords like this. It would be interesting to have just a big Berlioz video where I looked at different tutti chords across his life and explored how they changed as he saw the orchestra evolve to become ever more and more capable of the fantastic epic scoring that he envisioned. Now moving forwards, as these F-thirds are being held, diminuendo to triple P, we see everything walk down harmonically, maintaining the same harmonic positions all the way across, at least up to about right here. So we've got F, C, and then A. So that forms a 6-3 chord on top, and then the 6-3-ness of it 
is really underlined by the octave down of another A below that. Right? So that A at the bottom, the mediant note of the harmony being at the bottom all the way through, is going to keep that context going. And that continues on, as I said, all the way to this bar here. What's wonderful about this is not only do you get this throat tone to upper shalomo register clarinet right in here, you also get the lower clarino register clarinet scoring right in here, combining up with the first oboe and first flute, every instrument in its sweet spot as it makes its way down. Such wonderful scoring. And things get fairly low right in here, with the bassoons coming in to support the harmony from below, pushing up in this lovely phrase right in here, with the oboe just holding onto this F, to dovetail with these strings. And the dovetailing is fairly thorough. You have this D right in here, being taken over by D in the firsts, this B flat right in here in the seconds is trading off from this sounding B flat in the clarinets. Then the F being doubled here by oboe and clarinet is being taken over by the violas. And then right here we've got a D, and that is the same note as where the first bassoon ends up. So with the exception of this B flat thrown in for harmonic context, we have the strings taking over right in here, and notice how they are playing a B flat octave 6 3 chord. So, once again, we are in the 6 3 zone <laughs> with the mediant of the harmony right here on this D, and then the fifth on the F, and then the tonic on the B flat, and then an octave above that mediant, the mediant in the first violins of D. And this beautifully slurs downwards in the same exact harmonic positions for every string group walking right back up to here and it just has this wonderfully heartfelt sound. This also I feel looks forward to some scoring that you'll see from Strauss, from Mahler, perhaps from Wagner and Grieg and maybe even Tchaikovsky in his string serenade. This maintaining of the harmonic position as the music goes forward. Once again, I would call that a chorale. Not a chorale where you put horses in, but a chorale, C-H-O-R-A-L-E. Then the harmony evolves as things set up a five chord, leading to the very last variation, returning to the home key of F. It's just such beautiful scoring. Think about all those things. This is elegantly beautiful scoring right in here. The C octaves and then E, G by the violas and B flat right in here, ensuring that this is perceived as a 5-7 chord, just giving the listener more and more clues. And this G, C, E leading us to the F that is going to ground us back to the home key of this amazing set of variations. Listen for how the winds work their way down, the same idea, the 6-3 chord, and then scooping up from below with the bassoons to trade off right in here. I suppose that a texture-obsessed conductor could make this feel more seamless, with the winds really mutating into the strings here and continuing on with their own sound, but I think that would go a little too far. And of course, starting with this big, triumphant, pastoral symphony kind of chord here. Enjoy this screen. I know that I have. And I will see you for the fourth and final lecture on Movement 3, followed very, very quickly by the first lecture of Movement 4 next month.